welcome to this course on knowledge representation and reasoning. Uh, this is a course which is kind of a complementary course to another course which I teach which some of you have done which is on artificial intelligence. In artificial intelligence we focus more on problem solving methods and things like search and so on. And in this course we focus more on representation issues. So, knowledge representation uh, and I feel that knowledge representation is the core of an intelligent agent essentially as we will see uh, during the introductory lectures that if you want to think of building an intelligent agent the first thing that you have to worry about is that the agent should be able to represent the environment that it is in the domain that it is in the world around itself it should be able to represent its goals its and it should be able to reason about its own plans and you know do all that is necessary and at the core of all this is intelligent uh, of, of all this is uh, knowledge representation essentially. So, we will be recording these uh, lectures in half an hour modules and uh, initially for the introduction part I will mostly use slides then after that I will uh, have a normal writing session on classroom and in between in one or two lectures where I have lot of uh, text to be shown. I will again revert to slides essentially. So, let us just start with the beginning now this is something which which I also did in the course on AI, but since since knowledge representation is a core component of AI we will just kind of revise this and also it will apply for people who have not seen those lectures or have not done that course essentially. So, we will start with some basic definitions of AI. Uh, one of the oldest is by Herb, Herbert Simon is that we call programs intelligent if they exhibit behaviors that would be regarded intelligent if they were exhibited by human beings. So, this is a most standard way of thinking about AI is that can you make programs do what people do and of course, underlying that is the assumption that what people do is intelligent activity and that is what that is one of the oldest definitions Simon was one of the founders of AI essentially. Feigenbaum also is one of the old timers he says that physicists ask questions about this universe and seek to characterize behavior systematically. Biologists ask what it means to be a physical system and be living and we in AI wonder what kind of information processing system can ask such questions essentially. So, we are interested in building these systems which will be able to look around the world and you know ask these kind of questions and so on. Ellen Rich who wrote a book which was very popular uh, in the mid 80s I think she wrote and then it was augmented with Rich and Knight and then subsequently as Rich Knight and Nair. She gave a more computational definition to AI it says that AI is a study of techniques for solving exponentially hard problems. Now, those of you who have looked at structural complexity you would know that you can characterize problems according to the difficulty of how you solve them. So, for example, SAT is exponentially hard at least 3 SAT onwards they are exponentially hard TSP is even harder and so on. Now, if you want to solve those problems obviously, the problem itself is by, def by definition hard. So, you cannot hope to solve it optimally in any reasonable amount of time unless of course, it is a special case or it is a small problem in which case the exponentiation does not show up. What we are interested in instead is to find methods which in polynomial time will give us reasonably good solutions essentially. So, it does not for example, if you are solving the TSP you are not looking for the optimal solution, but a solution which is reasonably close to optimal essentially. And there are other communities which look at this kind of goals so for example, approximate algorithms and things like that, but AI essentially focuses more on the use of heuristic methods and knowledge and things like that. And Charniak and McDermott, so two authors who have another very popular book and I have used it quite often myself. Uh, they say that AI is a study of, com of mental faculties essentially. So, it is a study of human how humans think. So, it is more like a cognitive science attitude towards AI as to how do we think what are our mental fac faculties and the study is done by building computational models which will validate our theories essentially. So, if we say this is how we remember things this is how we 
store our memories or this is how we solve problems. Then if you can show a program which does something similar, then it is a kind of a validation. So, by and large of course, AI has had interest from two kinds of communities. One is the people who want to study intelligence or intelligent behavior or what is intelligence, the cognitive science kind of a cognitive psychology kind of a outlook and the other is who want to build useful systems essentially. So, you want to be build a program which will con control your uh, robot on Mars planet. So, for example, NASA had the rovers uh, landed on Mars and a lot of AI went into controlling those things because Mars is a place which is some 30 odd minutes away in terms of light distance. And so, you can't press a button here and immediately get a reaction from the vehicle. It takes some 30 odd minutes or whatever the actual time is for the signal to go there. So, obviously, you need to have to build autonomous systems, you need to build in some of the techniques that we are talking about essentially. But the definition which I like most is due to this guy called John Hogeland. He is a philosopher by profession and maybe that is why he gives this definition. He says the fundamental goal of artificial intelligence is to not mimic intelligence or not mimic human intelligence, but to produce some or not to produce some clever fake, but it wants a genuine article. It wants machines with minds in the full and literal sense of the word. So, he is saying that I do not want to see that okay, my machine can play smart chess or it can talk to you in natural language or it can analyze data and you know extract patterns. I am not interested in the outcome. I want to try to create machines which you would accept have minds of their own essentially. Now, that is of course, a very hard question to this thing, but we will sort of circumvent the notion of definition of minds and so on here. And then he goes on to say that at the heart of this <coughs> is a conception as deep as daring is that we are at root computers are ourselves. So, that of course, addresses the question of can machines be intelligent and if you say that you are also a machine then of course, you can be intelligent. So, the idea that thinking and computing are radically the same is the idea behind his book. So, his book is titled AI the very idea. It is a philosophical outlook to AI, it is not a technical book, it will not give you algorithms, the kind of algorithms that we will be studying, but it tries to ans answer questions like this. Now, there was a big debate about can machines think in the 1950s and so on. And Alan Turing that who you all know posed this test which we call as a Turing test, but which he called as the imitation game. Now, you must have heard about this movie which has just come out essentially. It's, it, in fact, the movie is called the imitation game and the movie is really about Alan Turing. It is a kind of a bio pick about Alan Turing, but Alan Turing himself called this test and imi imitation game, which, which is a kind of consistent with Simon's definition of intelligence that if you can exhibit behavior which human beings would exhibit, then you will accept them to be intelligent, except that in Turing's test, the behavior was, was exhibited by means of text data. So, you type in a question and uh, system types in an answer. So, it is like a chat box you interact with. Now, in computing, prediction is very hard. At all times, people have predicted all kinds of things about this will happen in so many years, this will happen in so many years and they have generally often proved to be wrong, especially when it comes to AI kind of predictions. So, for example, Turing said that in about 50 years of time, it will be possible to program computers with a storage capacity of 10 raised to 9. Now, he is talking in 1950 essentially, in 1970s also you got machines with 64 kilobyte RAM and the hard disk was 20 megabytes or something like that. So, he is talking in those times that to make them play the imitation game so well that the average interrogator will not have a reasonably good chance of making out whether it is talking to a man or a machine. And his, his game is described in this paper called Computing Machinery and Intelligence and if you just search for it, you will get it online in it quite easily. So, this is a Turing test. There is a human judge sitting on a teletype or chat box or nowadays maybe on a smartphone or something and chatting with someone. Only thing is the judge does not know whether he or she is chatting with a human being or with a machine. And the Turing test says that if the machine can fool the judge reasonably often, 
then it has passed the Turing test and periodically we get claims even in 2014 we had a claim from Warwick University saying that the Turing test has been passed and so on and so forth. But there is a prize called the Loebner prize which is an annual competition in which chatbots participate. So, if you just look up the Loebner prize you will probably get to see the chat sessions for 2014 contest and you will find some of them to be quite impressive. I have not copied them here, but I will leave it to you to look look at them and there is some money to be won if you win the prize essentially. Just a word about a program called Eliza, which was one of the earliest chat box developed by Joseph Weizenbaum at MIT. Eliza is named after Eliza Doolittle who was a working class character in George Bernard's play Pygmalion and so on. Eliza had some very simple rules to manipulate language. It would take a sentence manipulate it and throw it back to you. It had no notion of understanding, it had no representation about the world and things like that. It was just a simple you might say twister of, of sentences. You could take a sentence and convert it into a question and do that kind of things essentially without really going into the meaning of words essentially. And there was a popular version called doctor which was running hmm, trying to behave like a psychotherapist and there is a small uh, story about how a Russian scientist uh, who was visiting Stanford interacted with the program and this is a text from that interaction. So, I will ask you to read it yourself. So, if you can make out the color there is a bit of purple in there. So, that is those bits of sentences which indicate that how the program is really twisting a sentence. So, so the visitor says I am feeling a bit tired that is all and the program which is the doctor says why do you think you are feeling a bit tired. You see it is just taken the phrase from there and added a why do you and it sounds as if it is like a therapist essentially. Of course, human beings are very gullible we tend to behave believe all kinds of things essentially. But Weizenbaum was so disturbed by people's responses. So, for example, his secretary would confide all her life's problems to the program and you know she was aghast to know that Weizenbaum could read those responses. So, he eventually wrote a book uh, which says that we should limit the powers of the computer essentially. Much earlier people had been bring, trying to build real mechanisms to do reasoning. So, our focus is on knowledge representation and reasoning. So, if you for example, add two numbers you are doing some kind of reasoning. If I say 37 plus 12 is 49 then somehow I have come to this conclusion that it is 49. Now, if you want to make machines do these sort of things and arithmetic was one of the first things that people tried to tackle. You have to of course, first somehow represent those numbers and then you have to devise algorithms which will do addition for example. So, much before computers came people were interested in this sort of a thing and uh, there is a lot of folklore behind this. Uh, so, there is a nice book by Pamela McCorduck it called machines who think and I would advise you to read it if you are interested in the history of AI and things like that. So, this Arab astrologers were credited with constructing what they call as a thinking machine called the Zerza and the principle behind that was to generate ideas by mechanical means with the help of a technique called breaking down from which the word algebra is derived. And by combining number values associated with letters and categories, new path of insight and thoughts were supposed to be created essentially. So, Europeans were suitably impressed, and uh, uh, a Spanish or Catalonian missionary called Raymond Nunn, he decided to build his own device, which he somewhat largely called Ars Magna. And his goal, which you can read in italics, is to bring reason to bear to all subjects. By subjects, we mean people around us, and in this way, arrive at truth without the trouble of thinking or fact finding. If you had a machine which could do this for you, then why do you want to take the trouble of thinking essentially? Of course, now we have Google, so it does all these things for him. So, as I said, some of the earliest things that were happening were in arithmetic, and some of the names that you will see are actually well known names from the world of science. So, we start with uh, Pascal, after whom the language Pascal is also named, amongst other things. He invented a mechanical calculator using some set of gears a system of gears in 1642 remember much before you were born. He went through 50 prototypes 
and made, made this machine which is called Pascaline. It could add and subtract two numbers directly and multiply and divide them by repetition. So, this is kind of a picture of Pascaline which you can find on the web. So, I have given all the sources of where these pictures I have taken from most are from Wikipedia. He was given a right exclusive right to, to make and sell those machines, but he managed to sell only about 20 of them and so it was becoming too bad a business proposition for him. So, his startup in some sense did not work. His Leibniz you all know um, about in many areas we have heard his name. He worked on this calculator after Pascal and he devised what he called as a step drum. We will see a picture uh, which was used for 3 centuries this thing. So, you can see that there is a drum which is rotating and it is driving uh, it is rotating a red colored rod which has got gears fitted on it. And if you think carefully you will see that there are those projections on the drum which are of different lengths. So, depending on where the gear is placed in one rotation of the drum the gear will rotate after a certain amount of time essentially. So, you have some way of measuring a number you might say essentially. So, it is some mechanism for representing a number essentially. And so, he built this uh, device uh, and it could do division by repeated subtraction with 8 digit numbers essentially. Some of the earliest machines that were built by the machines I mean computers were also 8 bit machines essentially. Leibniz was as we just said he was not just a mechanical engineer he was a philosopher by which we mean that he wanted to understand everything in the world essentially. And he said that human reasoning could be reduced to calculations of a sort and he says that the only way to rectify our reasonings is to make them as tangible as those, those of mathematicians. So, mathematicians were known to be precise and he said that reasoning can also be precise like that. And so, we can find an error at a glance and when the dispute there is dispute amongst people we can simply say let us calculate. And, and resolve the dispute instead of you know taking out swords and fighting and punching and all kinds of unsavory methods of resolving disputes. You could just sit down and so there are two principles of his logic that our ideas are compounded from very small number of simple ideas which is something that we are now very familiar with. And complex ideas proceed from these simple ideas by a uniform and symmetrical combination analogous to arithmetic multiplication. So, we can understand this uniform and symmetric combination as saying that some kind of an algorithm that if you have a basic alphabet if you have a basic set of uh, atomic units then by applying algorithms you can construct more complex things out of it essentially. There was another device called the arithmometer built by Thomas Kolmar which was a really sophisticated device uh, and it was manufactured as you can see in the middle paragraph till about 1915 which is you know just about a 100 years ago essentially after which of course electronic machines started coming into the market calculating machines that took place during the second half of the 19th century so we are interested in representation and reasoning essentially okay so let's see what ada lovelace has to say ada lovelace was a collaborator of uh, charles babbage who's credited by many to be the first to to, to the, the designer of the first uh, c computer uh, computer and, and a computer is different from a calculator in the sense that it has a stored program. You can change the program and it behaves differently. So, the calculator can do only one thing, a computer can do many things. And Ada Lovelace was, a, was a somebody who worked with him, and she could see even at that time that the mechanical, the potential of Babbage's mechanical computer extended far beyond just number crunching. She writes about the analytic engine, which is one of the two machines that he designed he never built the analytic engine, but he had a good design after much later people built it after him. He says that it might she says that it might act upon other things besides number where objects found whose mutual fundamental relations could be expressed by those. So, if you can relate find relations between elements then the abstract sense of operation should be susceptible to adaptations to the action of operating notice. So, basically you can represent things in some way represent relations in some way and then you can apply algorithms on top of that and you will be able to do in interesting stuff essentially. 
and as an example she uses uh, the composition of music. She says that suppose for instance the fundamental relations of pitched sounds, so basically notes of uh, in the music system in the science of harmony and music composition was susceptible to such expression and by expression we should read representation and adaptations and by adaptations we should read reasoning. So, the engine might compose elaborate and scientific reasoning and I am sure some of you must be familiar that, that there are programs which now compose music. In fact, last year uh, or was it the year before last the guardian ran a, ran a kind of a survey in which they put up six pieces of music out of which I think one or two were composed by machines and four were composed by human composers and they asked the leaders to judge which one is uh, composed by the machine a kind of a Turing test you might say for, for music. Uh, and interestingly the people could not figure out which one is composed by music by the machine essentially. So, you if you if you search the guardian site you might actually find it somewhere the results. Okay, so, let us now move towards representation a little bit. Uh, in medieval Europe the idea about the world, so when people think about the world you know they are modeling the world essentially. It was based on a Christian adaptation of Greek ideas essentially. So, platonic notion of thing was that there is a creator who has got ideas which are perfect ideas. So, you must have heard about things like platonic love for example, you know that comes from the same source essentially like perfect which is the creator's idea from which we derive human ideas and from which the world also is made essentially. So, the world is made up of corruptible materializations of God's ideas. So, if you have a chair which is perfect then it, it resembles God's ideas if it is broken it, it does not resemble God's ideas. So, our thoughts are true. So, our interest is in representation and reasoning how can we talk about you know things that we represent and reason about them are true to the extent that they are accurate copies of God's ideas. Essentially. So, that was Plato his uh, disciple uh, and successor Aristotle did away with the notion of a creator and he says that human ideas are basically resemble the objects they stand for essentially. So, this is kind of known as the correspondence theory of truth essentially. So, if you are seeing something and thinking about that then you know the fact that you are thinking about that is related to the fact the truth value essentially. And much later Wittgenstein the philosopher had created what he called as a picture theory of language in which he says that uh, you create uh, memories or thoughts which are kind of pictures of things that you see essentially. So, let us look at the what what else the Greeks gave us they gave us this thing called the syllogism which I am sure you must have uh, read about. So, the Greek syllogism embodies the notion of formal logic this is one of the things we are going to be interested in our base for knowledge representation is going to be formal logic and the interesting thing about formal logic is that it is formal it depends only upon form it does not depend upon content essentially. And there is a notion of an argument we say that an argument is valid we will discuss these things in more detail when we actually look at logic. An argument is valid if it conforms to a valid form. So, it is the form which is important not the content it is not what you are saying what is important is that if you say two or three things which are the premises and then the conclusion is true if it follows a certain acceptable forms. Now, the Greeks gave some 19 different syllogisms out of which one we are mostly familiar with which is also known as a Socratic argument and you have surely heard this that if you are given the first two sentences above the line is the premises and below the line is the conclusion that if you say that all men are mortal and then you say Socrates is a man then you are allowed to conclude that Socrates is mortal and this argument is actually known as a Socratic argument it talks about Socrates who you might know was forced to drink poison because of his beliefs I think. So, that is why they are talking about his mortality. But if you look at this argument which is about Chennai it could be about any other city if we accept the fact that all cities are congested and then we say Chennai is a city then you can conclude that Chennai is congested. So, both these arguments have the same form essentially all x's are y's some z is an x therefore z is a y essentially 
as long as you believe in the first two, you are allowed to believe in this conclusion and that is a valid form. So, this form is a valid form, it is one of the 19 valid forms that the Greeks had given us. We will not look at those, we will look at more modern logics and, and rules that we use here. So, one last example, if you believe that all politicians are honest and if you believe that Sambit is a politician, then we have no choice but to believe that Sambit is it because all three arguments have the same form. Actually. So, in a valid argument, if the premises are true, then the conclusions are necessarily true. Actually. So, if, if the first two sentences are, if you accept the first two sentences, you must accept the third sentence. Okay, so, more on representation. Uh, here we have a picture of Galileo, which I have also taken from the Wikipedia, and there is a picture of Galileo with his telescope. So, he was a very well known for his telescope, essentially. But what we are thinking about here is that uh, he is talking about things like taste, odor, colors, and such things, you know, which are related to perception. You know, we smell flowers, we taste food, we see colors. He says, that taste, odors and colors and so on are no more than mere names as far as the object in which we identify them. So, if I see you wearing a red t-shirt, then that red is a name, it is a concept which I have and they reside in our consciousness essentially. So, they are represented in our consciousness. Hence, if the living creature were to be removed, all these qualities would be wiped away essentially. So, it is the fact that I see your shirt as red is something to do with me essentially. I mean your shirt may or may not be red. Of course, it, it you can argue that it you know it, it reflects a certain fraction of the spectrum of light and that 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 particular combination of fraction we call as red and that kind of definition you can try to give, but our perception of red or smell or taste is in our minds essentially. So, this is something very important for us from the representation point of view. So, he says philosophy basically talking about the world around us is written in this grand book the universe, it is written in the language of mathematics. See everybody is obsessed with mathematics because it is precise you know you can rely on it essentially and its characters are triangles, circles and other geometric figures essentially. So, Galileo we know him for his laws of motion. So, we have equations like v is equal to u plus a t and so on and so forth. But the notion of a variable was did not exist when Galileo was thinking about them. He thought about motion in terms of geometry. So, if, if you see there is a one of the equations has something half a t square or something like that. So, you can think of half a t square as the area of a triangle in which one side is a t, t is time and a is acceleration and the other side is time essentially. So, if you can visualize a triangle in which one side is time and other side is time into acceleration, then you can sort of compute something. So, he used to think in terms of geometry. So, he says that motion could be represented in geometry. So, he shows that geometry could be used to represent reason about motion. So, this is something very interesting for us. We want to think about motion, but we can use a representation which is basically geometry. Thomas Hobbes, which many people call as the grandfather of AI, he extended this idea. He was a political scientist and a, a philosopher and so on. So, he says that thinking is a manipulation of symbols. Galileo had said that reality is mathematical in the sense that everything is made up of particles and our sense of smell and taste and how we react to these particles. So, when we react, we, when we sense a smell, it is actually we are reacting to some particles which are emanating from the food or whatever that we are smelling. Hobbes extends this notion to say that thought too was made up of particles which the thinker manipulated essentially. So, you, you see we are heading towards this idea of representation. However, we had he had no answer as to how can a symbol mean anything. So, if I write the word C A T, it means something to you I mean right. How does that meaning arise essentially? So, that is a question which actually still is quite difficult for us to evolve, but we remember Hobbes was saying that thinking is equal to computation essentially. So, somewhere he says that by reasoning 
he says I understand computation and to compute is to collect the sum of many things added together at the same time or to know the remainder basically some kind of a mathematical algorithm arithmetical algorithm and he says that thinking is also like that that you create particles and you sort of you know reason over them essentially. This I have taken from the Stanford encyclopedia of this thing. So, Hobbes was influenced by Galileo just as geometry could represent motion thinking could be done by manipulation of mental symbols essentially. So, for those of you who know Calvin and Hobbes, uh, the character Hobbes was named after Thomas Hobbes essentially, you know, so it should increase your respect for him. So, let us also talk about Rene Descartes, we know Descartes from so many different angles, Cartesian coordinates amongst other things. He said that animals are wonderful machines, human beings were too, except that they possess the mind. Descartes was what people call as a dualist. He believed that mind was separate and the body was separate and he ran into all kinds of problems, philosophical problems, uh, unlike Socrates who had to lose his life, but Descartes was only grapple with problems. So, he, so, just like Galileo said motion can be represented using geometry. So, we are talking about representation. Descartes says that geometry can be represented by algebra. So, instead of drawing a line, you can write its equation essentially. So, you can use the variables and things like that and you can express geometry in terms of algebra and everything is applied math even thought essentially. So, everybody is extending this idea of maths to thinking essentially. Descartes says that thoughts themselves are symbolic representation essentially. Again if you read the book by Hogeland, you will get some of these insights. Now, there is a paradox of mechanical reasoning essentially. Reasoning, if reasoning is a manipulation of meaningful symbols according to rational rules, then who is manipulating the symbols? That is the problem essentially. The problem is it can be either mechanical, that is what people say, or it can be meaningful. Essentially. How can it be both essentially? How can a mechanical manipulator pay attention to meaning essentially? Hmm? We will maybe discuss this as we go along a little bit, because that is what we are going to talk about. We are going to represent things in, in some language and then we are going to write programs to manipulate that language, but we already know that we can you know write programs to add up numbers. Does it know the meaning or not is a question that we will look at gradually essentially. But people like Descartes were ridiculed by people other people they said oh it is a faculty of will it is some transcendental ego or a humanculus a little man essentially. So, you can imagine a little man manipulating the symbols in your head. So, it is the kind of people who are making fun of Descartes, essentially. but some very interesting ideas which in these concepts have been given by Douglas Hofstadter who you many of you would have heard about and I have listed three books by him here. Godel Escher Bach uh, which was published in 1979 or 88 got a Pulitzer Prize. Then a book called the mind's eye where I is the single letter I and more recently and his most fascinating book according to me is called I am a strange loop essentially. So, it is a philosophical outlook as to how thinking is possible in the first place essentially. Okay. So, what I will do is I will stop here uh, and in the next lecture we will come closer to logic and representation and talk about things that we will be interested in essentially. Okay, thank you.